Um, there's uh, been warnings errors or uh, exceptions that dealing with, with uh, being a sysadmin. I uh, just want to talk about uh, when um, dealing with the warnings as uh, the role, we have things that deal with ATMs that come in with transactions. And there's been one evening where we have a role that we do while we're on call once a week and transactions come in and when queues build up over time, uh, we have to monitor this stuff and we have a manual process that we uh, look at and when this queue gets over the limit in time, uh, it's kind of difficult to monitor these processes. Uh, thing about it is there has to be a way that we can automate these processes rather than doing it manually. Um, and that's what we're kind of trying to look at. So if you're like me, somebody that has anxiety, sometimes when you look at errors like this, uh, sometimes you can freak out. So, so we try to avoid things like this. And which leads me to the, uh, the title of this, uh, presentation, SQL Statement Data Gathering. So why should you care about this? The thing about it is you may not, with your roles in uh, computer or in IT, you may not have anything to do with ATMs, transactions, or anything like that. But the thing about it is uh, it's not really difficult processes uh, to do, but the thing about it is if you can kind of look at these processes and how to go about it rather than connecting to databases directly, there's things about things that in our environment people try to do things like, for example, web scraping, um, go about getting to their data differently, where there's easier ways of doing it, especially from an operations standpoint. They, it's easier if you have access to the source. For example, going directly to the database. And that makes things a lot easier if you have that sort of access. Uh, another thing is, what I think, is when I started using PowerShell, I used to create a lot of PS1 scripts. And there's nothing wrong with it if it's just a few lines, but now I rarely ever create PS1 scripts. Almost anything I create, especially if it has multiple lines, I create modules uh, for readability, testing, things like that. Um, I know I got a lot more I can learn from PowerShell, but any more I create modules. And a lot of people in my, uh, or in the company that I work for, they don't create modules. But if we can kind of lead people in that way, I think that we can be better off um, to kind of get people learning more of how, how better create scripts for their PowerShell. Uh, see here. Uh, for the agenda, we're gonna look at Linkscape automation and how we got to this and how um, we work towards it. Uh, the SQL Server module, uh, which comes from PS Gallery, and the ITOS verification module um, that is custom built, and a demo. And okay, um, I thought we missed the, missed a slide, but there. <laughs> This is me, so I got a little worried there. I thought we missed something. But this is me, I work at Teachers Credit Union as a system administrator. Uh, there's the QR code for Teachers Credit Union. We're a bank that 
is in the region of Indiana and southern, southern Michigan. So usually if you're not in that area, you may not have heard of us. And there's LinkedIn QR and my Twitter account. Um, just to let everybody know that I'm also a big Star Wars fan, so if you see any references to Star Wars in these slides, that's probably why, uh, just to be forewarned. Uh, there's a GitHub repo where I'm going to put all the slides at. And here's the, just give recognition to Teachers Credit Union because they so uh, generously helped pay my way out here to uh, the PowerShell conference. Um, system administrator role, they play, just kind of go through these fast because they play, they kind of have a, they have a, they kind of have, wear a hat with many roles, uh, usually level two support. Uh, if something's like more, no, needs a little bit higher level, we pass on to engineers level three, but usually we, pretty much do a little bit of everything, where it's networking, applications, processes, databases, a little bit of everything. But one of the main things we do is monitoring, whether it's ICMP, ping, uh, monitor ports, applications, things like that. The thing about ATMs is we can ping the ATM, monitor ports to make sure things are up, but what if, uh, people aren't getting their transactions. We, they can get, we can make sure people are getting their transactions or the money, but even though ATM is up, we can ping it, ports are up, doesn't mean that it's working. Uh, for example, there's a queue. Say for example, like, if the queue is building up and it's pingable and the port is pingable or open, I should say, uh, it could still be down. One example is if we're doing upgrades, right? So one night when it was doing an upgrade, it's down, and, you know, had to follow up, see what's going on, and this other sysadmin said he was doing, you know, an upgrade, but once we uh, figured that out, you no, know, um, the upgrade was finished, and then Q started going back down again. So that's one, one example, but that's okay. But there's, for example, if it was, you know, not the case, then that's an issue that we gotta look at. So, so what we're looking at is transactional data, which is data in the database that we look at, for example, if uh, that queue is building up, that data is in the database we just gotta get to. So the problem that we're looking at is monitoring ATM transactions. Possible solutions is, I'm sure everybody has any, third-party utilities that you can look at. One possible option was Automate that we have, which is basically a third-party utility. It's like a scheduler that has their own scripting uh, language. The thing about it is, is that we're not really, we use it mostly for FTP, moving files around. And we don't have a, uh, a license for the PowerShell part, but there's always ways working around that. But I didn't really want to go that route with Automate, um, since we mostly use it for FTP type stuff. We monitor things with solar winds, and we could use PowerShell for that. Uh, usually the things we do with SQL with that is, uh, you know, monitoring, we, if you send an SQL query, usually you get a true back if it succeeds and a false back if it fails. But it's not like getting the data back that you'll want. Uh, there might be other advanced stuff you can do with it if we have that, but that's not my knowledge extent, the SolarWinds SQL stuff. And then we have UiPath, um, which is kind of funny because that we have UiPath because the other day I was just walking around town in Seattle and I just noticed that there's a UiPath sign uh, so I don't know if that, that's their headquarters or something, but I thought that was kind of humorous. But we have UiPath, and they do a lot of window scraping and REST API type stuff. And, um, but we have a whole department that does RPA, but didn't go that route. But then we have 
PowerShell that we can just connect directly to the database. Not saying we couldn't use these other tools, but at the time, PowerShell was just the easiest way to do things. Now here's the Linksgate interface. This is the interface that takes care of all the ATM transactions. As you can see, we have, there's like a device ID, which is ID to each interface. And then under the, there's an SNF queue, you see the seven there, well that's the queue that we gotta monitor. Usually the higher that goes, that means transactions are building up. And if that gets high, well that can get high, but you don't want to get too much high. Um, you, that should always be changing, it only takes a few seconds. We have a refresh button, so what we're usually doing each evening as on call, we'll log in, look at that queue, and click the refresh button. Obviously, like UiPath could like just window scrape this thing, um, but usually we have access to the database where we can just go in and look at the data, uh, data logs and things like that. Now, SQL Server, there's really not too much to it. It's just in PowerShell or PS Gallery. You just install it, import it to your session, and you just use the command line invoke SQL uh, CMD. And we'll take a look at that in the uh, um, custom module that we built. Now here's the IT Ops verification module. As uh, it contains the Links Gate command list that we built. And I have an internal repository that we built. So it's install module, ITOS verification, import module. And have a little short demo. Hopefully this will go okay, because trying this for the first time, it's a utility seen on Slack that somebody else posted. Makes it, should make it easier than just typing everything out, so we'll see how it goes. So basically just do get PS repository to look at the one. So we have PS gallery, but the PowerShell uh, internal repository is just PS or PowerShell repository. So we have, a, we just install it import it, which imports into your PowerShell session. Oh, sure, Let's see if we can do that. Figure out how to do it here. There we go. Let's try and get built. I had it going there. <laughs> Is that a little better? Yeah. <laughs> um, so well, there we go. We uh, did that. That imported to your PowerShell session. And there's all the functions or uh, modules for the uh, ITOPS verification. And we'll go through each one, but most of them are for the interfaces for Linksgate. So most of them, once you see one, they're all the same. They're just going to a different interface, basically. And that's just the end of this short demo. Um, the main demo is towards the end. We'll see more. But let's see here. I just got to find my mouse. OK, uh, schedule act uh, task. We have a scheduling server. So all I did is basically schedule the task. Now, I wrote this script like four years ago. So like most people, when you write a script, and then many years later you look back, it's like I could have wrote it much better um, now that I know more than I did back then. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, this is a PowerShell script just in a, in a scheduled task. is just executing a PS1 script. Now that I know more now, I will have probably done it in a module. But it's, it's pretty simple. So going on, here's the scheduled task general tab. Redacted some the information for security reasons. Since it's a bank, I had to be careful what I can and can't show. 
So the thing is, uh, there's a service account here, and there's some pitfalls we run into uh, that I learned that you need to use a service account for password reasons, because it needs to be, uh, don't want your password expiring, so use a service account, and you gotta make sure that you have read permissions to the database in order to get that information back. Okay, Linksgate service account. Um, put, just put in some generic data here. Of course, uh, stump.locals uh, domain name. Uh, this is one thing that I've had to remind people where I work is the Bruce, this is a long user name, just a funny generic name, is the new, uh, the new logon format. The Bruce, this is a long user, is the short naming format in Active Directory. You gotta be aware of that because some people, when you create an Active Directory user account, that a lot of things use the old uh, naming format. So if they're using the new name long format, which might be over 20 characters, and they're saying, I can't log in because it's saying wrong username or password, it's because they probably need the short name. So then you just gotta say, instead of using Bruce, this is a long user name, you gotta use Bruce, this is a long user, or the short version of whatever that is. So which, the short uh, name uh, goes with the SAM user account. So, and that's my team's picture with Wookie, so. <laughs> but uh, if you look at the uh, Active Directory and PowerShell up there, it's the uh, same thing as the SAM account, SAM account username. So, and then the invoke linksgate status. Uh, this is the PS1 script, which is pretty simple. Um, back then, I didn't do much splatting, but this might be a good case where you could use that here. But basically, it's be, uh, just creating variables to sound email. And then the mail linksgate status report is basically just invoking a PowerShell script. One thing I had issues with is it creates an array. So I had output it to a string because the array made the email look all messed up. I wanted the email look really decent. So I just output it to a string. And here's one example of that. So I used a get type function just to show you that when I first did it, it was an array, the email looked messed up, so I just convert it to an out string or to a string object, it looked look a lot nicer. That's one thing I love about PowerShell is I'm constantly changing things from one object to another. It makes it very simple to do that. Another thing you gotta be aware of when you do in the process like this is when you're in a PowerShell session, you gotta import it. But when you're doing a pro making a process, you gotta make sure you put it into your profile. Now, I didn't mention it earlier, but uh, I have PowerShell 7.3 on my desktop. But we use, in our server environment, we use the PowerShell that comes with our servers, which is Windows 5.1. So you gotta be kind of aware of that, which is Windows PowerShell, but if you're doing Windows PowerShell 7.3, three or 7.x or whatever that is, then the profile for will be just PowerShell. So. And then in your, pro pro shop, or in your profile it is, instead of, or that's where you would put your imports, that way when it, the process logs in, those modules will already be available to you. Here's your Linksgate SAS output that I showed you in that PS1 script. All it's basically doing is just executing each module. Um, it's basically just as simple as that. And then when we go to, this is the only module that's really different than the others. Once we get to the others, it's basically all the same. So here, just a module, we're just creating two variables, none, because if they succeed, then it's just gonna be none. But if there's error, then we're gonna put the data into it. 
So basically we got, we're executing that invoke SQL command with the database server and query. And the nice thing about PowerShell is, even though I know something about SQL, I really didn't even know much about the SQL because when we did this, I was talking to my manager, and sometimes when he goes to look at this data, he goes into the database and looks at this stuff on the back end because it's faster than going through the web GUI. And sometimes when there's issues, instead of like doing refreshes and waiting for it to come up, he'll just go to the database and do a quick query, and he was showing me one day. So what happened was he was showing me the query, and he already had this SQL built. So I didn't even have to write any of this SQL. I just thought, well, he already had SQL, and he gave me or showed me the SQL. All I had to do was write the PowerShell script around it. I just had to add the, the SQL to it. So it, not that it didn't take a while to write, but I didn't have to do any of the SQL stuff. I just had to understand it. So I just added the SQL, made sure it made sense. And the thing about it is the only really important stuff is that we have the date because it is for the last 24 hours here. As you can see, 24, last 24, well, dash one, which is the last day. And because we want the last 150, anything over 150 records. Because that means anything over, anything that's more than 150 in the queue. Because that's in the links gate where you've seen that seven, that's how many are in the queue building up. So that's the important thing, which is in that if statement. Links gate data that dot count greater than 150. Then we just put in a for each statement. And then now we're looking at the operation date time. That anything that's in there for over 24 hours. So basically we're just looking for anything in the queue that's over 150 in the queue or in the next link skate data for each object, anything that's in there for over 24 hours. Because we're looking at two things, you know, over 150 in the queue or older than 24 hours. Because they should not be in there that long. And then this is the second part of that script. So, and then depending on what it does, we just put them in that, those variables. And then we're just creating a here string. That way we know what the output. Okay, and here's sample email is what we should get. Here, Linkscape status would be nine, none, for the 150, an error, none. That's if everything works out okay. The one on the right would be like an example if there was an error. So, of course, Linkscape error for over an hour means that everything's good because there's none. But the uh, warning above it with over 150 in queue means there's an error issue but with 253 in the queue. Okay, now here's, we're looking at the, the interfaces. These, um, they're basically all the same, so these should go pretty fast going through. But the thing about it is, the, the key about it is the date and the device ID. So here, the date is over in five, because if you look at the date diff there, it's over five days, but the device ID is 82, because each, each interface has a separate device ID. And then at the bottom, we're invoking SQL command and querying that here string, which is SQL, looking for that device ID. And here's the XB host interface. We're looking at device ID four greater than, well, here it's over in 15 days. It all kind of depends on what we're looking for, but basically we're just looking for depending on the date, and we might do ascending or descending, depending on what we're looking for, and uh, how old it is. So we're just doing that for each interface. And then we're just invoking it and outputting it um, to, the out, to the output there. And then here's the other interface. Here is device ID 80. 
greater than 15 days. And here's this one, device ID 105. And all these are pretty much the same, just walking through them. This one's device ID 103, greater than or the last 15 days, within the last 15 days there. Same thing here. So it's a pretty simple process once you get going. And here's the sample emails that we're outputting. Of course, these are all fours, but it could be communication error. There's a lot of different errors, and we'll look at those from the database table. And this is a table where you get the description of if it's successful or not. And of course, zero is undefined. Uh, but here I'm just using invoke SQL command to look at the device type on the, in the database table. And for notifications, this is a thing. For a while we used to use, we used to get text messages and then that became an issue with, I'm not sure what happened, if it was some policy or something that stopped us from getting text messages within our environment. Uh, but then we just started manually logging in, doing this manually. But then when we started using PagerDuty, which made it a lot better. So with PagerDuty, not only do we get, actually we get push notifications because that we have an app on our phone. And when basically it sends an email to PagerDuty and that when there's an alert and PagerDuty sends us a push notification. That push notification can, you, well, there's different ways it can alert us. It can send us a push notification, it can call us on the phone, it can send us a text, it can send us an email, there's a lot of different way, things it can do. And then not only that, uh, if we don't respond, what it does is it can wait five minutes and send it to us again. If we still don't respond, we have like a backup person, then it sends it to that person. And depending on how we have it set up, it might send it to them again if that person doesn't uh, respond, then it may send it to our manager, which is good because then we know somebody's going to respond if there's an issue. Okay, look at the demo here. Now, before, when I started doing this, I did it in, we're really limited to what we can and can't put on our laptops for security reasons. So I, it's not like I can put a database on my laptop. Uh, we use SQL Server, so I was like, well, I can, I, I can do, go get MySQL, free MySQL instance in the cloud. So I did it in MySQL, and it's like a week before this uh, conference, they decided to do an upgrade. It wiped all my databases and stuff off MySQL. So I'm like, gosh darn it. So I'm like, well, is there a way I can do this in PowerShell? So I actually was able to create the database and everything in MySQL, not even worry about the connection to the cloud or anything. So I thought that was kind of neat. Maybe if we have time, I can, we can kind of take a look at that. But let me see if I can expand this a little better. There we go. Okay. Here we're just installing the PowerShell demo. Here's all the functions for it, and we're gonna let's see here. Okay, we're importing the data into the 
the operations database. Originally, I wrote this for Windows 5.1. Uh, I was able to get, actually didn't have to do anything to make it work in 7.3. I just tried it in 7.3 and it worked. Here's all our data. Let's see here. It's, I don't know if I can scroll up. It's a little difficult when I'm looking on a different screen. There we go. Here we have the response type of I don't know if we can get smaller. There we go. And yeah, that's all our data. And Oops. sorry about that. It's kind of hard to see, but there's actually 151 records there. <laughs> So anything over 150 means there's going to be an issue. It's just not showing up really nice. Here we're updating the uh, device log. Basically just updating the database so that we can actually execute on, on the transactions. Okay, here's the other database we need, the transaction logs. And as you can see, these are all the device IDs here. Are, no, these are the device IDs and these are the uh, error IDs or status IDs. And instead of creating ta uh, actual data table for the status IDs, I just did it quicker. I just created a hash table. But basically, we're looking at the status types, which is the ID, which corresponds to the description of what each ID stands for. Okay, this is when we send email. This is what the first module is doing. So we have Linkscape SNFQ is 151 with uh, the second warning and the errors. And then here's an example of one of the interfaces that did. So the next one should do everything all together instead of going through each interface. We we'll just, I did one, I'll just do it all together. And this is everything all at once. It's kind of hard to see this, but again, and there's the, the first part of the output. And just got my mouse here. And call action. Uh, 
create modules instead of PS1 files because it's so much better and makes things more organized, better to test. And consider using PS uh, PowerShell to connect to databases rather than using third-party utilities because it's more efficient. Um, sometimes just better than going the other route if you're using web scraping, whatever that is. Uh, had one other thing really quick I wanted to show real quick. And I would kick myself if I didn't show it. This might make. Here's just a Linkscape demo top process that just kind of shows the transactions coming in in real time. It's a test. Um, there we go. That might be easier to see. But you can see the process is coming in. Uh, test member numbers, uh, amount. Operation ID, all the same data that we would have in production, but this is all in test within PowerShell. And if anybody's interested, with the code. I was able to create database tables using, I mean, I use hash tables and complete PS custom objects a lot. And of course, creating a database in PowerShell obviously isn't good for production instances, but if you ever need something to use for test, or maybe there might be some, something to look at you know, for a, using another data type uh, that maybe you want to see if it'll work better in a hash table or a PS custom object or something like that, uh, this really worked well for me. It's new object, system data, data type table. If that's something you might want to look at, it really worked well for me. Just letting you, putting that out there. Um, and that's all I got. Yeah, if you don't mind, I want to get a selfie, so real quick. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> yeah.